His wife was in the room. She was crying. He looked like a completely different person. What? He said, you got my husband back. What peptides are exactly? Peptides are simply chains of amino acids. And I first got into peptides. It was high-end athletes who were looking for a competitive edge. It's that time, it's just blossomed. We have peptides for the nervous system, peptides for inflammation, peptides for our skin. Most pharmaceuticals people don't feel, and even most oral supplements like vitamin D people don't feel. It doesn't mean it's not good for you or not necessary. The distinction I make with peptides is people feel them. Mm. Yeah. And that matters. Powerful. That's I was yeah. going to say. That seems really powerful. It's like we're turning the light back on. Mixing peptides with NAD. Is that a newer thing? Probably better than any tool or agent I've ever seen. People ask me a lot, like, if I could pick one tool that have gotten the most transformational results with patients over the years compared to anything else. I've never seen anything like it. Conover, welcome to The Squeeze. Thank you so much for having me. It's awesome to be here with you guys. No, this is a true honor. We're we're so excited. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've we've been talking about, you know, the idea of having you for a while now. So I'm just, I'm so happy that it finally came to fruition. Yeah, me too. No, I'm super excited to be able to talk to you guys. <laughs> for the listeners to get a better idea, um, Dr. Conover has become a friend, but we also both myself, Tay, have used him and his office's amazing services. Um, I've I've recommended Dr. Conover to several friends, family members. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know, I'm so thankful that we met you and what you do is so important. Um, but Dr. Conover has helped us look so much deeper into the root causes of our symptoms um, and has more of a holistic approach to things. Um, I, I, I figure we should just like start with, can you tell our listeners a little bit about your history of medicine and how you got sure. into this field originally? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Yeah, so I'm family medicine trained um, and I went into family medicine because what, what drew me to that specialty was, you know, building relationships with people. Like, that's what I enjoyed most. I, I could never, like, pigeonhole myself to be, like, a dermatologist or orthopedics where it's very narrow focus. And that's yeah. great for people who want to do that. But for me, it's really about the relationship with people over time. And family medicine was a good fit. I opened my own practice here in Charleston, South Carolina in 2006. And it was kind of a hybrid where I did traditional primary care, but I also included doing nutritional IVs. I can't remember mm. why I wanted to go down that path, but I did. But so, and this was well before, you know, hydration or hangover IVs were in vogue right. at all. Right. So it was very limited in terms of who wanted it. And it was actually people who were quite sick, you know, people with, you know, complicated diagnoses that were looking for alternative means or tools to help better themselves. And I was able to fortunately learn a lot about how, you know, nutrients work, giving them intravenously, giving them in alternative vehicles, meaning, you know, outside of just taking a pill. Hmm. And that has served me well over the years. My practice has certainly morphed and evolved. Um, but, you know, now I call it performance medicine where I enjoy helping people not only look their best, feel their best, but perform their best. And I think ultimately that's what most of us are looking for. You know, at any age or stage, how can we show up and be our best? Right. And so uh, I'm passionate about helping people, you know, get access to things that are safe, to things that aren't just, you know, approved by the FDA for this condition or that. I think there's a plethora, if you look historically, a plethora of tools that we can use from nutrition to acupuncture, chiropractic care, botanical herbs, peptides, nutrients um, that matter. Um, it's hard in, in this day and age to get reliable information on this, so we want to yeah. be a beacon for people and 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 help people in that regard. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, something that I just find is so special is really just how you approach things. I, you know, I have a background. In healthcare, I worked as a nurse. I worked during COVID um, in the hospital, and I really got to yeah. see like the healthcare system, like the ins and outs of it, and kind of like sure. the behind the scenes of it. And I definitely have, after working and like seeing those 
behind the scenes and what goes on behind the curtain. I definitely have, you know, my opinions towards the healthcare system and the things that could be done better, could be done different. Um, I'd love to hear from you kind of what, what are like some of the biggest problems that you are seeing in our healthcare system? I think it's complicated. I think it's a great question, but I mean, if we look broadly, you know, we spend as a country the most amount of money, but if we look at how we do in terms of conditions we treat, we're doing horribly. Hmm. So our standard of care in the conventional medical world is doing horribly in terms of helping people with cancer, with heart disease, with neurodegenerative disease, with you know autoimmune disease, with mental disease. All these things were not getting better. Yeah. And so the paradigm is set up is that people feel like they go see their doctor and that whole system is revolves around pharmaceuticals. While I think there is a time and place for prescription medicine, for sure, I think it has taken over and it's taken over too much that we're out of balance now. Mm -hmm. And so now people feel in order to be healthy, they have to take medicine. And if that were true, then we would see over time declines in the statistics of people being diagnosed with these conditions. Um, we would have a better, you know, life rate or less mortality, yeah. um, but we're not. We're, we're not making a dent whatsoever. And yet we're not also being truthful about the whole picture, which is we spend so much money. And in my opinion, we don't get the results. And therefore it's frustrating for people. They don't know what to do. And so the, you know, what I just want people to know is that there's always options, like tons of options for people that exist, that are reliable, that we can explore. Um, And it doesn't mean that if you're diagnosed with something that that's a death sentence per se, or that things, you know, have to go a certain way because your doctor says you have to take these medicines. And again, I'm not railing against doctors yeah. at all, but I think that, you know, having gone through it, you know, I'm a conventionally trained family medicine doctor. It's a hundred percent about the pharmaceutical model. We talked, we don't learn about nutrition. We don't learn about fitness. We don't learn about anything, but, you know, and again, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but really yeah. it's, if a patient comes in, whether it's in the hospital or it's in the outpatient setting, it's, The doctor's thinking, what medicine can I prescribe? As opposed to, you know, what what happened here? What is this patient's story? Like, what's going on with them that got them to this point? Yeah, I always say, like, medication. I mean, obviously, yes, there is a time and a place when, like, you need to take an antibiotic. You need to, like, take a medication for something. Mm -hmm. But I I started seeing a lot of the times that it was literally just a Band-Aid. They were just putting a Band-Aid over this, like, infected wound and, like, Sure. They weren't actually like treating the wound itself. They were just giving the medication and putting a bandaid over it. Hmm. And that's kind of like, mm-hmm. that was my biggest problem. I was like, but why, but why is, why are they, you know, why are they having low blood pressure? Why is there, you know, why are they gaining weight? Why is this or that? And, you know, and then you look a little deeper, like at all the medication they're taking. Like I would have some patients that are taking like 15 medications and I, I would know. say like half of them are either doing the same things as other ones and then it's giving them further complications or they're literally taking like opposite medications that are literally just clashing with each other and doing nothing. Yeah. So it's just, it's, it's such an interesting, interesting field that I'm very passionate about. Yeah. And it's right. And I, and again, like I think that that most people in medicine and healthcare have really good intentions, but I think the, the whole structure of it, um, isn't working as a whole. You know, we spend so much money at end of life. We don't talk about these things with with our patients, you know, in a meaningful way. Um, We don't talk about other options. And so it's very frustrating, I'm sure, for patients to not know what to do, to not know where to get reliable information. Um, And that's why it's become common. I mean, I've seen it in the last few years where patients are collecting doctors. You know, they have more than one because they, they can't get one doctor to kind of help them in a way that's going to help them across all facets of their life. So I totally understand that. Yeah. Um, but that makes it harder for all of us because no one's communicating. I mean, it's, yes, medicine exactly. is not a place where doctors communicate or other healthcare providers communicate well. So to your point, patients on 15 medicines because people aren't talking about it. Yeah, mm-hmm. that and was always like, problem. that was my biggest thing. Whenever I would send a patient like that home and like in their discharge paperwork, I was like, you need to go see like, your your primary doctor and you need to sit down and go through these medications with them because there's just you know someone from like the cardiologist is giving this and the neurologist is giving this and like 
everyone's just giving something, but there's no like one point of contact. And, hmm. you know, we're not, you know, as a patient, we're not like trained to be like, oh, okay, well, like, do I need to like consult yeah. one person about all of these? It's just, you trust the doctor sure. that's given it to you and you yeah. don't, you know, you don't think twice about it. So that, that was always my biggest thing is like, you need to like, so, so many patients have so many doctors. I'm like, you got to just like try to find one or at least just sit down with one yeah, and go over what Agreed. you're taking to try to, you know, help you out there. And I think, which I think that's great advice to give people, but I also think to piggyback on that. And when I tell patients is you have to be your own best advocate and, Unfortunately, you, that means you have to ruffle some feathers. And so if you're in the hospital, you have to be vocal about what your needs are and what your wants are. And on the outpatient side, same thing, because the, the healthcare system is way too busy. You know, most doctors who are you know, working within the insurance system, they have to see, particularly in primary care, they have to see a patient every seven minutes or so, you know? And so seven minutes, nothing can get done. Wow. But they have to see a patient every seven minutes or so because they're relying on the insurance to you know, reimburse them for the visits. And as that reimbursement shrinks, just from a financial perspective, in order to make ends meet, right, and pay the bills and keep the lights on and pay staff, the number of patients they have to see in a day grows and grows and grows. And that's a huge problem. Because again, I was there. I, <clears throat> again, I had this traditional primary care practice set up and I was seeing, it was just me, too many patients in a day. And I, and I felt like I was not being valuable and showing up. And so I, I rearranged my whole practice and I went to a cash-based practice. Really, it's a misnomer. It's really direct pay. And I lost most of the patients in my practice, but I did so it's because I wanted to be valuable again. Yeah. Because I didn't want to feel like I was rushing through. And um, it took a while to kind of recover and rebuild, but I'm so glad I did it so I can now really get to know my patients yeah. and really focus on that. Yeah. I it's love that. yeah. I mean, literally the definition of quality over quantity. Yeah. And I mean, you right. you feel that so much with you. Like I've you you just like from the moment I met you, you I instantly knew that you cared, and I think that's the biggest mm. difference well, with thank you. you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. No, and it's important because I think I mean all of us we're all you know here uh, essentially to kind of wake up and remember our purpose and. You know, when I was able to learn my purpose and it's really to help people in a meaningful way, it's really got to be meaningful to me. And I really enjoy it. And I know that I'm mm -hmm. contributing, but that's what we're all seeking, right? Like we're yeah. all out there to serve each other. Um, and that's what makes life really good. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, something we've learned over the years and since we are a mental health podcast um, is that physical health and mental health really go hand in hand. Um, could you help explain some of that further and just how much mental health can affect other things going on in your body? Yeah, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. I was thinking about um, this concept that I didn't come up with. And it's, you know, I think most people would say that their mind is within their body. But I think actually the reverse is true. I think our bodies are within our mind. And if you think about it from that perspective, it starts to make sense that, you know, like what is our mind and, and versus our body? It's, it's all one thing, but we tend to, I think it's, it's our mind, which is kind of, you know, pulling the strings, so to speak, pulling the levers. Right. And, and, you know, having that perspective, you know, whether you look at, you know, the extreme of like, you know, really amazing, athlete, you know, athletes, right? Mm -hmm. Where it no longer becomes about the physical training. It's all about their mindset and their mental training. I mean, that's an extreme example. Mm -hmm. But for all of us, you know, I think in order to be, for people to be their healthiest, what matters most is what they think about the things they're doing in their life, which is the mental component, right? And so, you know, people talk about nutrition and that certain diets are the best. Well, to me, what matters most is what people think about the foods they're eating, right? Mm. And, and that doesn't get talked about enough. It, it, you know, working out, same thing. What you think about the workouts you're doing are going to matter more than the actual workouts. Because if you're not showing up, if you're not awake for those workouts, if you're not present, you're not getting anything out of it, right? Or, or if you feel like it's a chore, yeah. which a yeah. lot of people do, like, oh, lifting weights, I, oh, I hate it. Yeah. Well, then it's, it's going to be negative for you. 
So I think it ties in. I think we have to have both, but I, I think the more we understand how the mind works and then the influence of having a healthy, positive mindset and then how that trickles down to how you show up physically yeah. and then vice versa is critical. But I, 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 there, you, to me, the most important thing is, is having a healthy mindset for sure. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, that's great. That's so important. Okay. I don't know if you guys feel this way too, but I feel like there are just so many dogs suffering with health issues and actress Katherine Heichel, who's helped save over 16,000 dogs through her foundation says she's seeing more and more dogs with joints, odors, and other health issues more than ever before. And after doing a ton of research, she feels that there's one place we can look to for support of any dog's health, their food. So she decided to create something she could actually feel good about feeding her dogs. It's called Superfood Complete. Superfood Complete is made with over 30 of the healthiest ingredients on the planet, including several superfoods vital to your dog's health. Badlands Ranch also supports the Jason DeBus Heigel Foundation, which has helped to rescue thousands of dogs and place them in loving homes. Our pets to us, our two little sweet girls, Remy and Lily, they are like children to us. We are those dog parents. So their health and their wellness truly just, it means the world to us because we, we want them to live forever with us. And Implementing good, healthy food into their routine is something that is so easy to do. So it's kind of like a two-way win. It's easy for us, but it also is so amazing for the girls. You can go to badlandsranch.com slash squeeze and order right now to get up to 50% off your regular price order with a 90-day money-back guarantee if you want your dog to experience all these incredible things. You can go to badlands, B-A-D-L-A-N-D-S, ranch.com slash squeeze today. This is the summer of wellness, and I feel like so many of us are starting to really focus on our health and wellness and implement things into our routines like working out, eating healthy, things like that to help with our health and wellness and really just starting to take that next step. And if you're looking for something simple to add into your routine, you need to check out Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic. I've been taking this product for years and years, years, years. And I will take this product until they stop selling it because I just truly love it so much and what it has done for my gut health, my digestion, my regularity, my skin. It's crazy what this little pill can do. It's actually a capsule in a capsule, which is really cool because it actually like makes it all the way through to your gut, which a lot of probiotics don't do that on the market. So it's really cool to trust a product and be able to take it and know that it's good for me and going to do good inside of me. So go ahead and join me this summer and support your gut with Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic. You can go to seed.com slash the squeeze and use code 25 the squeeze to get 25% off your first month. That's 25% off your first month at Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic at seed.com slash the squeeze code 25 the squeeze. You guys, if you do anything, please, please try this product. Um, I'm curious, how do some of your non like pharmaceutical tools, like, you know, peptides and NAD, we're going to get a little more into peptides, but, um, how do yeah. some of the things that you offer help with mental wellness? I feel like we should yeah, start no, with the question. what peptides yeah. are yeah. because uh, I mean, before okay. I, before I met you, I didn't really fully understand with what peptides are exactly. And I think sure. a lot of people don't. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'd love to explain and, and. You know, peptides have become really popular, um, certainly in people like peak performers and people in, you know, who are looking for a physical edge, but uh, there's a whole host of peptides. So peptides are simply chains of amino acids and amino acids are truly the building blocks of life, right? So there are certain amino acids we call that are essential amino acids that we use to build solid structures in the body from, you know, tendons, ligaments, muscles, bones, all the way to neurotransmitters in our brain. A lot of signaling is done with these amino acids. So a peptide is simply where we take these amino acids and put them together. If it's, if it's 40 amino acids or less, we call it a peptide. If it's 41 amino acids or more, we call it a protein. Hmm. And so 
they essentially they're just the building blocks of life and and they're all naturally occurring molecules now when it's a peptide they tend to be put together in a novel combination and so you'll have peptides that are two amino acids in length and then you have amino acids that are you know 35 amino acids in length mm. by definition though they're small molecules and because they're small molecules um they really work well with signaling so they make the signaling cellular signaling or cell cell communication much more efficient and when i first got into peptides which is probably about eight years ago um it was from the competitive crossfit community these were you know high-end athletes who were looking for a competitive edge but were not into using things like harsh tools like anabolic steroids yeah and so we got into these fitness peptides which were peptides that would help one put out more growth hormone and those have names like semorelin or ipamorelin tesamorelin um, and then since that time, it's just blossomed. We have peptides for the nervous system, peptides for inflammation, peptides for the immune system, peptides for mitochondria, peptides for our skin. And what we found is that if we start combining peptides together, just like people would do with, you know, like supplement stacks, yeah. that we had great synergy. And so by and large, these peptides are injected under the skin um, that one person can give themselves. Um, most are given daily, some are given twice a day. Um, and they're very, very safe. And I can say that, you know, cause we've overseen a lot of peptide, you know, treatments over the years and it's very, very rare to have any sort of side effect, let alone a, a negative side effect. So what I like about them from the start is that they're safe. Mm. And then number two, what I've learned is, you know, that they're effective. And so they, they help people feel something. And so whether that goal is you want to lose weight you want to sleep better, you want to be more cognitively better, you want to help boost your mood, most peptides start working within you know, three to four weeks. And so people can notice. It doesn't mean it's going to change your life in three to four weeks, but it's different than you know most pharmaceuticals people don't feel. And even most oral supplements like vitamin D people don't feel. It doesn't mean it's not good for you or not necessary. But I, the distinction I make with peptides is people feel them. Mm. Yeah. And that matters because... Really, if we look at like, if we're talking about mental health, and mental well-being, kind of the end stage of that is when people become so numb in the world they live in, they don't feel anything anymore, right? And there's a lot of that going around. Right. Mm. Right. What about what about NAD? Is is mixing peptides with NAD, uh, is that a newer thing or? I think it's a newer thing, yeah. I mean... So NAD, to back it up a little bit, is a vitamin B3 derivative. So it's a chemical cousin of niacin. And um, we use it primarily intravenously, although with COVID, we started using it more like a peptide shot where people could give, you know, smaller dosages to themselves at home. And, uh, you know, NAD grew up in actually the addiction space. So it was in the 1990s that people would travel to Mexico to get intravenous NAD to help them with substance abuse, primarily alcohol, opiates, even pain medicine. Mm. And what NAD does, uh, it does several things, but one of the things it does is it works at the level of our mitochondria, which is the battery of the cell, to help our cells make more energy. And, you know, on just a very simplistic level, when someone doesn't feel good, when someone is depressed, anxious, because this is where we started using NAD a lot back in the day, um, they need energy to kind of work through that. And NAD, probably better than any tool or agent I've ever seen, helps people have more energy super quickly. I'll give you a, a, an example. I had a patient, this was many years ago, referred to me. He was on disability because he was depressed, couldn't work, mm -hmm. uh, hadn't worked for a while. He had some other things going on. And so he's referred to me to, to just to help with that. And, and I said, before we deal with the other things, I, I want to help you feel better. And so we did a loading dose of NAD with him, which was five treatments, five IVs within 10 days. And I remember after he finished the loading dose, he came back into follow-up. He looked like a completely different person. Really? His wife was in the room. She was crying. And yeah. she said, you got my husband back. What? This is the first time he's been back in years. Like we are thrilled thrilled that he, you know, feels better, has more energy, his mood is better. And I was like, this is amazing. Let's continue. You know, I, I'd like to continue, keep up the momentum. And they clearly had something else going on because they said, we appreciate it, but we want to try something else now. And I never saw them again. 
What? So they had some other kind of mental disease that they were working through where, you know, he liked being sick on some level, right? Huh. But I bring it up because that's what NAD does for most people. Within a very short, another example of a patient, super depressed and anxious. She was in her late 20s, lived with her parents, couldn't hold down a job, couldn't hold down a relationship. I mean, really struggled. And we did the same loading dose of NAD, but she emailed me after the first treatment. And she said that 80%, of the anxiety that she's had her entire life is gone in one treatment. That's NAD. And so it quickly wow. gives people the energy, I think, to help their nervous system start to work more efficiently. It's like we're turning the light back on, but we're turning it on pretty quickly. Jeez Louise. It's powerful. That's, I was yeah. going to say, that seems really powerful. Wow. Oh it is. It is. And I, I think... It's, you know, again, people ask me a lot, like if I could pick one tool, one treatment um, that stands out to me, it's, it's NAD. I think it's the most transformational, um, you know, results. I've gotten the most transformational results with patients over the years compared to anything else. I've never seen anything like it. Wow. It's I amazing. Need to start taking it again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You didn't <laughs> love it there at first. <laughs> it's uh. uncomfortable. Yeah, no, I tough. yeah, it would just make me re like lightheaded for like thirty minutes, and then I would be fine after that. But then again, I, I did not feel a thing, so yeah, I guess it's just different for different people. Yeah, it is, it, it, it is. is, and some people are more sensitive for yeah. sure. I mean, yeah, look at me with the freaking tiniest dose of magnesium in the thing, and I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah, you clearly got something yeah. going on. I'm zonked. <laughs> why why am I like that? <laughs> I mean, it's probably a good thing, right? I think when people are more sensitive, yeah, it's probably a good thing because you need less of whatever it is. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, obviously, it can go too far where people get who are really sensitive can be sensitive just like to normal environmental things. Yeah, and then they have trouble because sounds bother them, smells bother them, colors bother them, things like that. Yeah. What do you um? What would you say is the most common misconception about peptides and non-pharmaceutical tools? That's a really good question. I think the challenge is, honestly, I think part of the challenge is, is that we as a society kind of deem something to be qualified if it's gone through the rigors of a study, of right. an official, like, academic study, which, you know, by and large are run by pharmaceutical companies. They're double-blind, placebo-controlled studies um, to show either safety, efficacy, or both. And so I think people, when we start talking about non-pharmaceutical tools, a lot of people get hung up and say, well, what's the data, right? Yeah. Where, where can you show me that it's, this, it's been published? And when we're talking about these tools, most don't have any clinical data. You know, some have animal data. Most are just physiologic studies showing, for example, that, let's talk about NAD, that it's been studied a lot and show that it's safe, for example, we have very scant clinical data. And so it's hard for some people. Now, I would still argue that anecdotal data to me is super powerful. Anecdotal meaning like observational data. Yeah. And having overseen thousands upon thousands of these treatments, I render it safe. That's how I explain it to patients. I say it's not for everyone, but I think everyone should try it. Um, and some people have a hard time that they say, I need to see some published data. I don't know if that's ever going to happen, you know, and I'm also very skeptical of the published data because I think these pharmaceutical companies, right. you know, sway the, the direction that the study goes. And yeah. um, I know people don't like hearing that, but I just think that's the truth. Yeah. I feel like you should be using the anecdotal data, data over that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense to me. Yeah. I, I agree. No, I, I, you know, I was at a, this was years ago, I was giving a talk at some business about, <clears throat> you know, sleep and using different tools for sleep. We were talking about the botanical herb ashwagandha. Ashwagandha has been written down in the historical record for literally thousands of years. It's been well-established um, as an agent that helps calm people's nervous system, helps with cortisol. And a gentleman there raised his hand. He said, well, what about the studies for ashwagandha? Mm -hmm. What can you tell me about that? And I said, well, there's not studies, but it's been in the historical record for thousands of years and to me that's a stronger mm -hmm. argument for it than doing a study he goes oh no 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 like it doesn't count unless you study it i'm like okay okay it's, it's hard to you know <laughs> yeah. i don't know i don't know what to say to that yeah yeah because like in a way like 
you know, in a way, it technically has been studied because people are like still using it. I mean, obviously not studying in the way that he's saying it, but yeah, it, yeah. In my opinion, if it's been used for that that long, that's some form of a study to me. Um, no, I agree. I I agree. And there's you know, and I'll mess up the details, but I know I read this a while ago that even in ne Neanderthal graves where they found Neanderthal skeletons. They would find, and this is true for you know mummified you know ancient Egyptians as well. They found different botanical herbs, and some of these botanical herbs tasted horribly. And and again, I'll I don't remember the details, but what the conc a conclusion is, is if you're including it in the grave, you know, to potentially go into the afterlife with people for something that tastes horrible, there must be some health benefit that they mm. perceive from it. Otherwise they wouldn't have included it in the grave, hmm. you know, with the buried skeleton. And that happens a lot. Yeah. That's right. find. That's interesting. So. Mm. Um, I'd love to hear if you have an opinion on, on birth control and the hormones surrounding that. I recently, um, I've been on birth control for quite some time and I recently had this whole little, um, what would you call it? Situation where, I had run out, my gynecologist had retired, and I basically was off of my birth control for about a month. And I ended okay. up like detoxing from it. And it was like one of the worst experiences I've ever experienced. Um, I was fully in a depressive state, could not get out of bed, could not think straight. My hormones were up, down, left, right. Like, she was down for the sure. count. For I was just like a good four or five days just. It was wow. like, yeah, it was rough. And I finally realized that it finally clicked in my head that I was like almost like just detoxing, withdrawing from this birth control. Um, yeah. And I just, I just had never even thought about that being a thing because, you know, a lot of our friends that got, are trying to have kids or have had kids, they just say, oh, I, I went off my birth control and then nothing really gets talked about further. So when I had this mm. whole like, hormonal crisis. I was like, Oh my gosh, what is going on? But throughout this, we just shared it recently on a podcast episode and there's definitely like mixed reviews on birth control and just kind of how it affects your hor hor hormones and just hormonal treatment in general. So I'd kind of love to hear if you have an opinion sure. on that. Yeah, I do. I mean, I, th I think that birth control, which by definition are going to be synthetic hormones, right? We're talking about a synthetic estrogen and then usually it's paired up with a synthetic progesterone so by definition these hormones are not bioidentical and if we want to be a little bit hyperbole they're alien chemicals right but they do serve a purpose and they can serve a purpose for preventing a pregnancy they can serve a purpose for when women have you know super heavy menstrual periods which is debilitating um, they can serve a purpose there to kind of level out the hormones so that their symptoms of the super heavy menstrual periods, you know, are not as severe, um, you know, in, in really severe endometriosis where, again, you get uh, uterine tissue that's outside the uterus being kind of turned on. Um, you know, there are, there is a time and a place certainly for birth control for people who choose to go that path. I don't think they're told though that these are very, very heavy chemicals, very strong molecules. And that should make sense to people because they're doing some heavy lifting, right? They're preventing, you know, for example, the, the most used, or I think the most used uh, way people use birth control most is to prevent pregnancy. Well, if you're preventing pregnancy, that means that you're doing some heavy lifting internally. And I think in the short term, a lot of people can handle them. What seems to be, though, is women get placed on them in their late teenage years and then may stay on them for 10, 20 years yeah. um, without much discussion, just thinking, okay, I'm supposed to be on this birth control because I got put on it when I was 18. I don't want to get pregnant, and I, and I understand it. But I, it's like most things, like most of these medicines I don't think are designed for forever, but when we make them forever, we're going to have some fallout from that. Yeah, And then it's, it's hard, right? So then it's hard, like, well, what is an alternative? And what I tell my patients, female patients, you know, I can understand not wanting to get pregnant. And if you're still, if you're in a position where the male is not ready to have a vasectomy, 
then I think the next best option is a plain copper-based IUD Mm -hmm. where there's no hormones Mm. so that you don't get any hormonal manipulation of your own internal hormones. And a lot of female patients have a tough time getting that because their OBGYN wants to use something called Mirena, which is a progestin-based IUD, meaning a synthetic progesterone, and that's going to expose you to synthetic chemicals. And it's a challenge. And so it's a tough subject, but it's, it's yeah. worth talking about. And it's certainly, I think, you know, my hunch is, I don't know, but my hunch is that women, when they're counseled and put on birth control, none of this is talked about. They just said, oh, yeah. we want to prevent a pregnancy or, oh, you've got really heavy menstrual bleeding. We're going we're gonna to calm that down. Yeah. And then women get stuck on them. Yeah. And that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's definitely something that I've experienced because I went on it at like, 15 because I was having like mm-hmm. really bad cramps and like mine would be like really bad back cramps and I was dancing um growing up and so I literally would like have to stop dance and I was like this I can't do this so I've sure I just never went off of it and you know here I am like 12 years later and haven't really had I mean my girlfriends and I have conversations about it and um you know it's just it's really hard to get like an actual answer and I recently just saw a gynecologist and she, she was telling me the benefits of birth control and like that it's a good thing I'm on it. And so it's just like, so. It I mean, it's, I think good, I think good is relative, right? So, yeah. I mean, it may be good that you can take your heavy menstrual cramps off the table. It may be good for people who are looking to prevent pregnancy, but at what cost and everything has a trade-off, right? Like you can't be naive and say, Oh, it's all good. Yeah. Everything has a trade-off. So it, again, to me, in this scenario, if people have an information, they can be sovereign over that choice and they can be sovereign over it every day or every month they make that to take that, which is, okay, I understand there's some risks or a trade-off by taking this, but the, the pros outweigh the cons. I don't think that discussion ever happens. I think you have, just like you found with your gynecologist saying it's all good. Well, then people go away thinking, oh, I, there's nothing to worry about. They're synthetic chemicals and they manipulate your hormones and, and I think they cause problems. Um, and I think that's worth having a discussion. And if people want to go forward with it, great, but at least they have the information to make that choice. Yeah. Yeah, that's good advice. Did you get your hormone advice? Yeah. <laughs> I just got to figure out what we're going to do here. I ended up getting, I got back on it because I was miserable. I was miserable. But yeah, no, it's definitely something that, I mean, I, yeah, I guess I would, I would prefer to not be on it, but if I. So- have to do this yeah. whole thing again? I'm not really looking, <laughs> looking forward to that. Well, well, here's another option just to throw. This is how I would handle that is if you came to me with that, I would say, let's measure your hormones. And for that, we would do a month-long saliva test, right? You'd have to be off the birth control, right? So there would be a period where you wouldn't feel good. But we would measure your hormones using saliva because it's a really good means you can do it at home. And we'd look at your estrogen progesterone through an entire month, mm-hmm. right? And from there... We can have more information about biochemically how your hormones are behaving as opposed to, which is how most pharmaceuticals and doctors treat it like we're robots and give everyone this massive dose, right? Mm -hmm. Because maybe you who's being sensitive, you could take way less of something and still Mm -hmm. benefit. Wow. But the only way to know that is if to, to, to measure and understand what's going on the inside. Right. Huh. That's a thought. I love tests like that. I was just telling him I want to do um, this. Well, I guess this could lead into our next topic, but I want to do the blood test that um, helps kind of like to tell you what you're allergic to, like what foods to stay away from. Food sensitivity. Yes. We just had a friend that did it and he was like, like very like such random things. Like he had to give up red meat. He gave up like arugula. Yeah. He, like The most random things, but he's been doing it for a bit now and he's lost so much weight um he feels yeah. so much better his energy levels are just through the roof he's like, and it's he was glowing all, like actually yeah i was like what the I, you could just see it on him um and I, I it was actually the first thing i said to him i go wow you like you look and feel amazing and he's like yeah right. i got i got a blood test done and i've you know i found out my food sensitivities and i've eliminated them and literally that's all i've done but it's changed my life that's super interesting. 
I know. Yeah, it tends to be. I mean, we've we've done a lot of food sensitivity testing over the years with patients, and it's like you said, it's seemingly random. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. it's hard to understand. I remember uh, there was a period of time I, I've got migraine headaches since I was thirteen, and there was a period of time where I was getting a a lot of them. So yeah. I I did that test. This was many many years ago. I did a food sensitivity test, and my top three, you know, foods that were I was reacting to were mint blueberries and watermelon hmm. and on the surface I'm, I'm thinking you know i do eat a lot of blueberries because they're supposed to be a superfood I, I like watermelon i was using a lot of mint and i was like there i eliminated all three and my migraines changed dramatically really and there's no way i could have figured that out just by guessing all right oh you know frick. yeah that's an interesting test assist. for sure yeah i have the same thing but well migraines like run like my nana has migraines my mom has migraines yeah I luckily don't get full on migraines that often, but I get a lot of headaches. A lot of headaches. Yeah. Taylor always, you don't get mad at me, but you're always like, what? Something is going on. Something's wrong. Something's it's, wrong. The amount of headaches she gets and how long they last, <laughs> they just like, I'm like, something is going on. Oh. Yeah. Well, it, it's probably tied into your hormones. I mean, because a lot of women yeah. we've helped who've gotten migraines and who have, you know, even chronic daily headache, it improves when you improve their progesterone status. You know, and and they end, you know, so a straightforward solution is giving women bioidentical progesterone, not estrogen, but progesterone to balance out because they tend to be very estrogen dominant. Um, and that may be occurring with you too, particularly yeah. what you said about your heavy menstrual cramps. You're probably imbalanced, part yeah. of your genetic makeup or whatever, and you just have too much estrogen. Yeah, because I think my mom, my mom takes some hormonal supplement, something, but... I can't remember what it is. I should ask her what it is and how that relates. Hmm. Oh, I just love all these testing. I love learning things like this. It just, it like gets me so excited. I'm like, draw all my blood and tell me everything that is inside of There's, me. Uh, like, we cannot be more Yeah, yeah. No, it's fun. It's, yeah, There's Taylor's, a lot you can check. <laughs> Taylor's like, don't. Don't touch my blood. <laughs> no, you're literally going to get a text from me after. I'm like, so can I do this? And can you tell me all the other tests? I'm like, yeah. tell me where to check. There's a lot. Tell me where to poke. I'll give you my arm. <laughs> um, back, to, back to this F word, um, food. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, talk about something that can affect us physically and mentally. I mean, you, you speak about how food today is literally poisoning us. Yeah. What's large question here, but what's going on with our food? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I do think, um, to your point, I, I think that as a society, we've, over the last you know many, many decades, We've made the choice that convenience matters more than quality. Yeah. And I don't think that's just our country. I think worldwide, we're looking for ways to make everything convenient. Quick. Um, and as a culture, we, you know, we have chosen that processed food, for example, which is easy to make and reheat and do this, is better than taking our time and cooking food and using real food, you know, fruits, vegetables, animal protein, dairy, you name it. And that's the biggest problem is because we then have companies like Monsanto using things like Roundup and glyphosate and the exposure to the environmental chemicals is out of control. And if you just look at the soil, you know, I remember reading a while ago, if you look at, for example, the soil, which used to contain a lot of minerals and elements, and they've linked the one element called chromium with, you know, lack of blood sugar control leading to diabetes and, and some people obviously heart attacks. Hmm. And so that lack of chromium in the soil completely parallels the rise of heart disease in this country. Yeah. And that comes about because we're making our soil, our water, our air way more toxic than it ever has been. Mm -hmm. And we're doing so in the guise of we're making things more convenient, cost less, easier for people. Um, but it comes at a cost. Again, it's another trade-off. Yeah. So I think what's good for people is it's not that you have to be paranoid about it, but at least acknowledge, you know, that this is going on. And then you're able to make a better choice or at, at least own like, okay, I'm not going to, you know, grow my own food, but I'm going to, you know, institute X, Y, and Z to help myself, you know, be healthier with what I eat. Yeah. I know that's kind of a loaded way to look at it, but I think it matters. Right. Yeah. When we, um, we live by an air one and we've lived by it for like four years now. And 
the difference in I have a, I've always had stomach issues. I was like born lactose intolerant, like mm. always she's always had some gut problems. But the difference I've seen in my gut and how like just my digestion, like how everything is, like when we're actually like, you know, buying good food that, you know, you know where it comes from, you know it's safe, you know it's good for you. Um, it's crazy like how much of a difference that makes. Um, but obviously price wise and location wise, that's not like a realistic, you know, resource for a lot of people, but something that my mom, sure. uh, my mom uses this a lot is, I don't know if you've heard of this guy. His name is, uh, Bobby Parrish. Is that his last name? <laughs> my mom's I, obsessed yeah. with him. Do you know who it is? I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Oh, uh, people just worship this guy. My mom loves him. Um, <laughs> he's uh, just because he, you know, he, he goes into like, you know, Costco's and he shares like ingredients to look for. He shares like, you know, things that you can buy that are clean, that are healthy, that have good ingredients from, from Costco, from like Aldi, from, you know, actual yeah, like grocery stores that aren't Air One. Yeah. Um, but it's really cool because he wow. has this, he has this app and it's like to see, you could scan the like um, ingredient list and see if the food is like Bobby, Bobby approved. approved is what he calls it. <laughs> and That's it'll, awesome. it'll give a rating of like, this is like a hundred percent of Bobby approved. It's like, no, it's not great, but it's not horrible. And then if it's bad, it'll like right. say, yeah. but it's so cool. And I think that's something that like, I think a lot of people like could use, you know, we're very fortunate to have an Erwan by us and to not, you know, they have a lot of healthy products where we don't even have to blink an eye. Yeah. Um, but this app sure. is something that's like really cool. I was just talking about it with my mom yesterday and it's, it's really cool. It like pulls out the specific ingredient too. That is like, the chemical in it or whatever it is. Why it's not. Yeah. Bobby approved. Why it's not Bobby approved. <laughs> right. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I got to check that out. I mean, I hadn't heard of it. But I think that's an amazing resource for people. Yeah. 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 What about um, what about the carnivore diet? Good, bad? What do you have? Have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I think if you look at the, uh, again, nutrition always seems to be a loaded question because people have their belief system tied into this. Yeah. And um, what I think is, is that, um, we all gravitate towards different diets throughout our life, and that's great. I don't, I don't think one is better than another. Like, I think it's, you know, the, the adage, like, with exercise, you know, what matters most is the one you can be consistent with, right? I think the same with is what you eat. And I'm, I'm a big fan of animal protein. I think that eating animal protein, <clears throat> you know, makes it easier to get the critical nutrients you need. But if someone wants to be a vegan or vegetarian, I think they can still do it. And if that's their choice, great. Um, I do have, you know, I personally seen with a lot of patients in my practice who are recovering vegans where we close the door and they, you know, they tell you they feel horrible. And I think it's harder to get the core critical nutrients, particularly amino acids, protein from a, you know, purely vegetable or plant-based diet. But again, everyone's going to gravitate. And I think that's great. Um, the best thing for people to do is try it. I think Something like carnivore, um, people start off, but again, it's 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 harder to maintain longer term. And so, but I want people to try all of it, right? Because how do you know? Like, how would you know if you respond yeah. or how, you, how you're going to respond unless you try it? So I've heard countless stories of people who do great with carnivore diet. Like mm -hmm. they love it and that's great for them. I have less people who say, hey, I can do well with a plant-based diet, and most people are somewhere in between. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, I think people have to try it out. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, we had a, a friend of ours. He just started it, and he was like, I've been doing it for, like, how long did he say? Two weeks. Our friend that cuts our hair, he he come over, and he was, like, looking slim, like chiseled. He's he's a very buff guy. And um, yeah. he went on to tell me that he's been doing this carn carnivore diet for, like, two weeks but he had lost like 12 wow. pounds, like something like crazy. And we were like, what? That's awesome. Huh. But yeah, he definitely said it's, it's a little hard. He feels like, I thought it was interesting. He said he feels like he just like keeps eating. Like he never is like full. Really? Yeah. But he's still losing weight. Interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Huh. And then I, we told someone else that and they were like, oh my gosh, his cholesterol. I could never. So it's so, it's so just like however your belief is on it. So I love that you're so, you know, encouraging of like, try it, do it. Yeah, see if it works for you. See what you want to do. Great. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've, on other podcasts, I've told this story, but I'll, I'll say it again. There was a study, I'll mess up the details, <clears throat> that I bring this up a lot with patients. There was a study they looked at 
Um, they took a group of uh, Swedish women and a, and a group of Thai women. And the first part of the study, they gave the Thai women traditional Thai food and the Swedish women traditional Swedish food. And it was the same caloric content, same you know content of different nutrients. After they ate the food, they drew their blood to look for different nutrients. Second part of the study, they switched it. So they gave the Thai women Swedish food and the Swedish women Thai food. Same thing after the, they ate, drew their blood. Third part of the study, they took the food and pur- pureed it. So the Swedish women ate, you know, pureed Swedish food, which didn't look like food anymore, and Thai women ate pureed Thai food. All three phases of the study had different results, meaning um, that they had different nutritional markers that came out, even though it was the same exact food. Hmm. And so a conclusion of that study is what you think about your food changes what it does for you. What? Yeah. Everybody Which is why we like, t- talk about the mindset. Skinny. <laughs> right. Yeah. That yeah. Sure. And that's why I tell people, I mean, jokingly, I'd say I'd rather you love the McDonald's than hate the kale. <laughs> you know? Wow. That's a good saying. The pureed thing is nuts. It is. It's, it's a crazy study. But it shows you the power of the mind. Right. You know, like what? Yeah. And that's why, like, you know, because people ask me all the time, well, what do you think about having a glass of wine or having some alcohol? I said, well, what matters most is what you think about it. Right, because if you're if it's going to help you, you know, kind of transition from your day to your night, going to help relieve stress, then I think it can be a good thing. Obviously, dose matters, and it yeah. seems like if you're doing one glass or two, that's better. But why to take it to extreme? If you think wine is bad for you, why would you drink it? Like, why would you ever do something you think is bad for you? Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. But we do this. I mean, this is what we do as humans. And we're caught up with eating. And then we say, oh, my God, I'm a terrible person. There's a lot of shame. I should never have eaten that pizza. Yeah. And I think the stress of that is way worse than the pizza. Right. Mm. That's good. Wow. That's powerful. Yeah. I like that. Um, is there any, like, research that you're doing right now or a colleague that you like is doing right now um, that's – new or something that you're excited about? I mean, for us, we're, we're excited about, um, you know, trying to find different combinations of different peptides, how we can stack them to make them, you know, more accessible, um, learning about, you know, having a better consensus in terms of, okay, this is the kind of someone, you know, this is their age, this is their fitness regimen. Okay. These seem to work better. Um, we're also, what we're doing is we're coming out with, uh, should only be a couple more weeks, but we have a powder, kind of a sleep powder that we created. Mm. And, and one of the things we put in this powder is something called zeolite. And zeolite is like this volcanic rock, and I think it's going to gain a lot of traction, not just with us, but with you know lots of different products. But what's neat about zeolite, like we were talking about earlier, it, it cages off kind of toxic things in the body. And I'm of the thinking now that really all of us probably on a consistent level, need to be taking something like zeolite because we're exposed to so much toxicity Mm -hmm. from pesticides, chemicals, chemical solvents, you know, pharmaceuticals, things in our water, things in our air, heavy metals, you name it, that we need something to help on a regular, consistent basis kind of cleanse ourselves and get rid of these things. I think it's that important. And Mm -hmm. so I'm excited about this sleep powder that we're coming out with soon because oh, wow. it'll have that zeolite yeah well no that is exciting i'll try it yeah <laughs> i know for sure i love that would love you guys to try it yeah um is there um if not no problem but is there any health fad trends that are going on right now that you find to be not true at all or one that you wish more knew about that's an interesting question. I know. I think I've seen, you know, I think, and, and I don't, I'm not going to pretend I, I know, but I, I've seen a lot of more people with mold-related illness in the last couple of years hmm. where people are saying that their exposure to mold, and, and we have it here in where we are in Charleston because of the humidity, right, and because of the moisture just in the environment, you know, yeah. we're below sea level, so hard for things to drink. We're around a lot of water. Um, but it's interesting because it, it's one of those phenomena that as, as we talk about things more, we notice it more. As we notice it more, it seems to be more real. And I don't know the statistics, but I hear it more and more from people 
that they had to move out of their house, that they had to get remediation. And this is a relatively new phenomenon that I'm aware of. Yeah. You know, we didn't talk about this five, 10 years ago, and I talk about it a lot now with patients. And I, I don't know if it's because, again, if there's, we're just talking about it more or if it's more that people are paying more attention. Hmm. Um, but it's definitely a real thing. I mean, you definitely have people who then go on vacation from their house and they say, I don't have any more runny nose, stomach ache, I'm not inflamed, don't have a rash. Well, there's something going on where they're being exposed to something in their house. Hmm. It, it's kind of hard to pick up on them. Yeah. Oof. It is true, though. We know several people that yeah. have had those situations. You, know, you guys know several people? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. In the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. It stresses me out all the time. It's interesting. Yeah. I feel like that's that's something that is scary to me because I'm like, you don't, like, you can't see it. You don't know it's there. Right. So that's, it's true. Yeah. Things like yeah. that make me. Make me a little nervous. Um, last question. Um, if someone's listening to this episode right now and they're like ready to take the next step, they're you know interested in taking a peptide or even just getting their like mind, body, soul back on track and taking that next step, what yeah. are a couple of those like first few steps you would recommend? Because it's definitely like overwhelming when you're like, I want to better myself but there's so many options. Yeah, where do I start? Yeah, where would a good place to start be? I mean, from our perspective, we like working pe- with people to help figure it out. So usually we can help guide people either with just a conversation or, as we talked about earlier, doing some sort of like biochemical testing, some lab work, gives people some objective, something to work from. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I like people. I, I think, I, you know, remember those choose your own adventure stories. I, I call this like choose your own challenge. I think we use you know, the next goal in our life to really help sharpen our skills. So if you're working on body composition, that's awesome. If you're working on sleep. Um, it seems that we gravitate and move to these different challenges, but we do so because on this physical realm, we're really helping to sharpen our mind, our spirit, our body. Um, but sometimes we need some objective markers. You know, I think a lot of people need some lab work to say, oh yeah, my, my sugar or glucose is high or whatever it is, my vitamins are low or my hormones are out of balance, that then we can start tweaking, mm-hmm. uh, making an intervention. And it doesn't mean you have to take hormones, doesn't mean you have to take anything strong, but something that then you can measure and work from to then then we can get feedback and, and understand what the change is. So from our perspective, yeah, I mean, we like helping guide people. and um, But if people are looking to do it on their own, I, I like people to be really, you know, singularly focused if they're trying to make change in your life don't try to change everything just pick one arena of your life like if you want to sleep better really focus your attention and energy of creating the best environment for your bedroom you know taking supplements to help you sleep um whatever it is to focus on that if you want to lose weight focus on that but don't try to you know do it all at once that that rarely works yeah yeah that's great yeah. Do you have any more questions? I don't have any more questions. I'd like just to wrap with reiterating something that I said earlier, but um, I'd like to just say it one more time is, you know, I'm so thankful for you. Um, and I, I, I really think what differentiates you from anybody else that I know of in your space is truly how much you care um, in your heart. Obviously, you're an immensely, you know, smart man and know what you're talking about but the separating thing for you is just truly how much you care about your clients um and that really shows so thank you from the bottom of my heart um you know Mm -hmm. for just being that human for us and our family friends and everything you do Mm, well i appreciate that very much taylor that means a lot i mean that's what i'm I'm in this for and yeah. to be seen and recognized means a lot. So yeah. thank you. Mm, awesome. I appreciate that. Thanks for joining thank us. You, Thank you guys. Awesome. I appreciate Sweet. it very much.